Hello everyone, welcome to lecture five of the course Philosophy of Science for Psychologists. We start this lecture by looking at two questions that Karl Popper asks. We also look at the answers, of course, but we'll see later in section three why he gives these answers. But we look at these questions and his answers to see where we're going with this lecture. After we've done that, we briefly compare Popper and the logical positivists because there are similarities, but there are also differences, and he really did not belong to the logical positivists. Then we'll discuss his views. His view is called falsificationism or critical rationalism. So we'll explain what falsificationism is. That has certain characteristics. Characteristics. Uh, he's a rationalist, so I have to say something about what his views are about innate ideas, because I earlier said that all rationalists, in some sense, accept the idea of innate ideas. Then we look at what is so critical about his rationalism and we'll end by evaluating that his um, uh, theory indeed is a rationalism, even though it's very different from Plato or from the ideas of Descartes. After that, we we'll look at the problems with his views and then we'll look at uh, what we have to conclude about his critical rationalism and see what we have to do next. Let's look at two questions Popper asks. In earlier lectures, we saw that induction is generalization and is an invalid way of reasoning. Now, if we use induction in science, and we know that induction is an invalid way of reasoning, doesn't that make scientists irrational? Should you not try to use uh, a way of thinking that is valid? So get rid of induction. So can we save science from the irrationality of induction? That's one question that Popper asks. So can we get rid of induction? because it's invalid. And the other question he asks, and that's in response to the logical positivist, is can we come up with a better demarcation criterion than uh, the two the logical positivists came up with? And he answers yes to both questions. So he will argue that we don't need to use induction in scientific thinking, in scientific reasoning, and he also provides us, provides us with a new answer to the question, how to distinguish science from pseudoscience. At the beginning of this lecture, we saw that some people are inclined to think that Popper was a logical positivist. Let's compare some elements from various philosophies of science to see that he wasn't, but that it's understandable that people made this mistake. In previous lectures, we saw that the most radical rationalist was Plato. And then later in the 17th century came along Descartes and he was a rationalist, but he also argued, as we saw, that we can uh, acquire knowledge by using our senses. You have to check in with the ratio then, but still you can use your senses to get not get um, to know things. Um, and Popper uh, also is not as radical as Plato was and is more in line 
with Descartes. So he was not a logical positivist, so he was not saying, he was not an empiricist, so he would not say that the source of all knowledge is experience, but he says experience is important for knowledge. But he thought that the logical positivists were way too radical. So, so he agrees on some point there, but also disagrees that uh, it's not uh, only experience. So reason is really important. Um, and he also agreed that logic and mathematics are tools and do not provide us with any new knowledge. So that is contrary to Kant, of course, where Kant says um, that uh, mathematics uh, can provide us with synthetic knowledge a priori. Popper disagrees with that and therefore he agrees on this point with the logical positivists. But he clearly is not a logical positivist. They had different models of science, for instance. So the logical positivists said, okay, we are empiricists, so we watch, we observe, and that could be, uh, after Bacon, could be the observation of the results of experiments. And then via induction, we get to general laws. We have seen several A's that were B, and now we think that all A's are B. And then we try to confirm or even verify those laws well we can't verify them but we try to find more evidence in favor for them so that's what you do Popper says no that's not a model of science he says first there is a problem and he refers to Newton who wondered why does the apple fall from the tree and then some hypothesis a conjecture is postulated so a hypothesis is generated there is something like gravity and then what you do, according to Popper, is you don't try to confirm your hypothesis, but you try to refute it. You try to falsify your conjecture. We'll get to that in a moment, but here is, here is a clear disagreement between the logical positivists and Popper. The logical positivists are trying to find support for hypothesis, Popper says, no, a good scientist tries to refute their hypothesis. Let's now look in more detail to the philosophy of science of Karl Popper. He defended a critical rationalism. I'd like to explain four important elements of Popper's philosophy of science. And the first one is that he defends falsificationism, and that has several elements. So we start by looking at that, at what his falsification is. It's all part of, the, of his bigger uh, philosophy of science, of course. We've seen in an earlier lecture that um, I argued that all rationalists do in some way or form uh, accept uh, nativism, and if we look at that, if we look at this, this theory, then we are born with at least some knowledge or something like that, that there's some innate knowledge, then we also get to discuss uh, Popper's ideas on induction. Now, as I said before, he is a rationalist, he's a critical rationalist, so we need to see what is critical about his rationalism, and that indeed it is a rationalism. So first, is falsificationism. Popper said, Marx and Freud are examples of pseudoscientists. So Marxism and Freud's psychoanalysis are pseudoscience. And Newton and Einstein, those are examples of proper scientists. And then the question, of course, is what's the difference between pseudoscientists and real scientists? So Popper is interested in this problem of demarcation. In one of his texts, he suggests that truth is the demarcation criterion. And of course, scientists would like their hypothesis to be true. So is that the demarcation criterion? Is a theory, a statement, only scientific if it's true? If it's, and if it's true, is it thus scientific? And then he says, no, a scientific theory does not have to be true. Of course, you cannot accept a theory that you know to be false. But does it need to be true? No, Newton's theories, many of Newton's uh, claims turned out to be 
false, but they were still scientific claims. Old astronomical theories were false, but not unscientific, according to Popper. And he argues that it's not truth, but it is falsifiability that is the demarcation criterion. So what does that mean? Well, let's take, let's take one step back, because first we need to look at human fallibility, and then we go to falsifiability as a demarcation criterion. And the interesting thing, I think, which makes a very good argument for falsifiability being the demarcation criterion to separate psi from pseudoscience, is that only falsifiable theories are informative. And that means that growth of knowledge, according to Popper, is only possible via refutation, via the falsification of hypothesis. So let's first look at human fall fallibility. Human beings make mistakes. That's just what human fallibility means. We are not always right. Not even our greatest thinkers are always right. Newton turned out to be wrong in many aspects of his physics, and he was replaced by that. Uh, his theory was replaced by that of Einstein. And that's why Popper says we can never actually know, right? We can only make um, educated guesses. It's really easy to bypass our human fallibility when we are making claims, because if you have a falsifiable claim and thus run the risk that what you are saying is false, like if you predict that tomorrow it will rain, then your prediction can be false. You just add or not to it, and then you will always be right. So if I predict that tomorrow it will rain or not, that will be true, and I will find confirming evidence tomorrow. So that would make me a really good scientist if truth, confirmability or verifiability would be the demarcation criterion. But we don't accept tomorrow it will rain or not. We don't accept unfalsifiable claims as scientific. And Popper argues that, for instance, uh, Freud's theory is constructed in such a way that it's unfalsifiable. So it has basically the theory has basically the same structure as the sentence tomorrow it will rain or not. So the theory Freud makes predictions and he will always be wrong. So in your history of psychology class you probably have heard about um, uh, Freud claiming that uh, boys want to sleep with a mother and kill their father, that they all have an Oedipus uh, complex. And this comes from ancient Greek mythology where the oracle predicted that Oedipus would kill his father and marry his mother, and in the end, uh, he uh, did so. Uh, and then Freud says, all boys have an Oedipus complex, they want to sleep with a mother and kill their father. And then you say, well, that is a falsifiable claim, right? So just ask a, uh, ask a boy, do you want you to sleep with your mother? And then the boy says, no. Then the hypothesis is falsified. All boys have an Oedipus complex, just one boy needs to say no. However, what will Freud, what would he have said then? He would say, well, they are in denial. Ah, so basically the theory is constructed like this. If you ask a boy if he wants to sleep with his mother, he will say yes, or he will, he will say no. Okay, that's an unfalsifiable claim, and therefore it's unscientific, and that is why psychoanalysis is something that you get in your history of psychology class and you don't get entire courses in uh, psychoanalysis um, because, well, it's utterly useless. So what did Freudian say? Well, our theory can explain all cases because we can, we can explain it when a boy says yes and when a boy says no. And there are all other kinds of constructions in, in Freudian, Freudian psychoanalysis. If you uh, accept the diagnosis, you're cured. And uh, if you don't, you're still ill, stuff like that. Um, so that is being regarded by the defenders of the theory as something that's really strong. 
But Popper says it's really a weakness because it is formulated in such a way that it's not falsifiable. You don't run the risk of being wrong. So he calls this immune for falsification. It's an immunization strategy. And it has a really nice upside. That is, you will never have to give up on your theory because you will always be right. Every boy you ask the question will either say yes or no. And it's a bit different with Marx's theory of history. Initially, Marx's own theory was falsifiable. It was a theory about uh, the socialist revolution. And because it was falsifiable, it was initially scientific. So his, his uh, theory on history would be, um, for if, if we were to looking at um, uh, the uh, socialist revolution, if there would be one in a country, then first the means of prediction would change, then the social conditions change, then the political power changes, and lastly, the ideological beliefs change. And then there was an actual socialist revolution, the Russian revolution, and then the political power changed first. So basically his theory got refuted. What did his adherents do? They changed the theory in such a way that the order of these changes could also be different. But then you basically say, if there's a revolution where all these things need to change because otherwise there is no revolution, then there is a revolution. Yeah, duh, that's then immune for falsification again. So you can use this immunization strategy in two ways. You can, from the start, make your theory immune for falsification, or you can, when the theory runs the risk of being falsified, change it later so that this particular falsification, in this case, the Russian Revolution, would be, a, would be the falsification of Marx's theory on history, uh, that this particular falsification no longer is a falsification, but actually is empirical evidence in support of the theory. And then that is unscientific, according to Popper. So what they did was they saved the theory by an ad hoc reinterpretation of it. Now the theory was always true, but not scientific anymore. So the theory had been made immune. Popper says, if you look at these examples, then it's clear that running the risk of being wrong, that's, that that is the hallmark of a scientific claim. The criterion of falsifiability is a solution to this problem of demarcation. So how do we distinguish science from non-science, from pseudoscience in particular? Well, science make, makes falsifiable claims and pseudoscience does not. It makes claims that are unfalsifiable. For it says that statements or systems of statements, theories, in order to be ranked scientific, in order to be uh, classified as science, must be capable of conflicting with possible or conceivable observations. So you must be able to make a prediction based on your theory. Your theory says uh, the world uh, is like, like this, and therefore we predict that we will see this there and there, uh, and then you see something else. Okay, then your theory is falsified. Your hypothesis is falsified. You should be able to run that risk. If you don't run that risk, your theory is not scientific, but pseudoscientific. When Popper was 17, he read in the Times, Revolution in Science, New Theory of the Universe, Newtonian Ideas Overthrown, Newtonian Ideas Refuted, Falsified. And later, when he was thinking about science versus, versus uh, pseudoscience, it was exactly this risk this risk of ideas uh, possibly being overthrown that made such an impression. So what happened? Hutton basically claims that light goes in a straight line, always, well, not always, but uh, uh, sometimes it occurs, uh, but really, really uh, 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 for a small number. And then Einstein made a claim that life curves way more 
the Newton predicted around a heavy object like the sun. Okay, so different predictions. And then Addington was an adherent uh, of uh, Einstein. Uh, he did the experiment. It's a very complex experiment. I'm got, not going to um, explain it. If you look at the longer version of this lecture, there I explain it. So if you really want to know what it is, uh, how, how the experiment went, uh, you can look it over, up over there. Uh, but I will uh, uh, not ask anything about it uh, on an exam, obviously. Uh, and it turned out that Newton was wrong. So Newton's theory was, as was reported in the Times, uh, refuted. It was overthrown. And Einstein's ideas were, what Popper calls, corroborated. There was empirical evidence, but he will, would not say that Einstein's ideas were true, were verified. He would not say that. He says the following. The impressive thing about this theory of Newton, the theory of um, Einstein, is the risk involved in a prediction of this kind. If observation shows that the predicted effect is definitely absent, then the theory is simply refuted. The theory is incompatible with certain possible results of observation. In fact, with results which everybody before Einstein would have expected. So Newton ran a risk and everybody thinks that he was right. And it turned out he was wrong. He basically took a huge risk. So that was impressive. And then he argues that what happened was that Eddington did the experiment that falsified the theory of Newton, but it didn't falsify the theory of Einstein. But also it didn't verify it. It didn't, didn't show that it was true. It was confirmed. And Popper says, confirming evidence should not count. Why not? Well, what you need to do is to really test the theory. And that means that you need to try to falsify the theory. And then when you're unsuccessful in doing that, that is, you find confirming evidence, then that is in some sense relevant because that gives you no reason to give up the theory right now. And he calls that corroborating evidence. So corroborating evidence is confirming evidence that you uh, acquired via an unsuccessful uh, attempt to refute your hypothesis. Important question for you, of course, is whether psychology is a science according to the demarcation criterion of falsifiability. And I guess most of you are working on your bachelor thesis. And my question to you would be, what's your hypothesis? My guess is that each and every hypothesis of all the students in this group are falsifiable. Uh, so that would be good, right? Then your thesis, according to, um, if it contains only falsifiable claims, your thesis will be scientific. Now you can find many examples of scientific claims. EMDR uh, is an effective therapy for PTSD. That's a claim that's being made in psychology that is falsifiable. Uh, you have a, a, a client with PTSD, you perform EMDR and it doesn't work, then it's falsified. Uh, someone like Kahneman would argue that loss feels stronger than gain if we're talking about uh, economical uh, um, uh, psychology. Um, if people report that that's not true, then that is falsified. Um, you could argue, you could claim that aut the, an, autism, uh, an autism spectrum disorder is caused by a genetic deficiency. Well. Uh, if it turns out that genes do not play a part there, then that's a falsifiable claim. So, is psychology a science according to this demarcation, de demarcation criterion? The answer is yes. 
So basically, you know what you should observe to reject any hypothesis in psychology. So this is good news if falsifiability indeed is the proper demarcation criterion. And there's a very good reason to think that it is. And that is that only falsifiable claims are informative. And now we need to go back to the start of this course, because we started with uh, thinking about knowledge and what the source of knowledge is. And then we say later, it's science. So we are interested in gaining knowledge, in gaining information about the world. And if I tell you that tomorrow it will rain or not, or that EMDR is a good therapy for people with PTSD or not, then I'm not telling you anything new. I'm not being informative. So if a scientist is someone that does research in the world with the aim of gaining knowledge, to gaining information about the world, and then comes up only with claims that are unfalsifiable, then you say, well, why should I give you money? Why should we give you tax money to research things if everything you are going to say has the structure a or not it's going to rain or not it's going to snow or not emdr is a good therapy or not autism is caused uh, autism spectrum disorder is caused by genes or not it's caused by a virus or not that's not informative so a prediction has to be to the point to be informative but if you do that you run the risk of being wrong. If you write in a horoscope, there may be problems at work. Yeah, there always may be problems at work. And if they, if they don't they don't arise, then what? Is the theory is this claim falsified? No, I said there may be problems at work. I didn't say there will be problems at work. Okay, so this is really why falsifiability is such a good demarcation criterion. It shows that if you make claims that are unfalsifiable, your claims are not informative and therefore are useless. If you read something like there may be problems at work, well, throw it out. It's, it's useless. It's not informative. Tomorrow it will rain or will not rain. Then you will, will, will uh, uh, look up what the weather will be uh, tomorrow. Uh, somewhere else if someone tells you this. This is not informative. So if we look at what we are doing in science or what we're doing at Till University in science, what do we want to do with our knowledge? We want to improve the world. We want to understand the world. In, the, in our case, society, we want to understand human beings and improve it, advancing society, understand society to advance it. And as a psychologist, you might want to help people with mental problems or you want to do the research so that other psychologists can, can become clinical psychologists and help people that have mental problems. And I think that's a very noble goal. And unfortunately, we do need a lot of psychologists. And they should have knowledge. They should have, every psychologist should make claims that are falsifiable. And therefore, you always will run the risk of being wrong. That's the risk of being a scientist. So, an important part of knowledge is that it has to be true. It's a justified and true belief, but you might be wrong. And that's a big problem in science because people expect scientists to be right all the time, but it's built into science because all the claims are falsifiable that in many occasions you will be wrong. That's just the way it is. And if you know you're wrong, and still adhere to your theory, then you're a pseudoscientist, and I would even say a criminal. And that takes us to another part of something that's uh, 
in our educational programs of this university. We want you to have knowledge. We want you to have skills, obviously, and also character. So it's, I just gave you a strategy based on Popper's ideas, um, how to be always right. Just add or not to your Un, uh, to your falsifiable claim, making your claim unfalsifiable. So this immunization strategy will make you the best psychologist in the world because you will always be right. And then you can say things like this: EMDR works because making eye movements requires capacity of the work of the work memory, which makes retrieval of memories less efficient, resulting in having a faint memory. Or not? Yeah, sure. You will be right. It will be that or something else. What is important is not that you're always right, but that you honestly believe that what you say is, is right, is true. So that's, that's a difference, right? You should not be a liar, but you will always need to be informative. So you will always have to use falsifiable claims and therefore you always run the risk of being wrong. And as soon as you know you're wrong, you say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I have to change my theory. I'm no longer using uh, this theory to make predictions. I'm no, no longer using this therapy if it turns out that it doesn't work. Um, but prior to that, if you honestly believe that they are true, then uh, even though they, they might be false, uh, then according to the criterion of falsifiability, you are a proper scientist. This also means that you should be careful in what you say, because you always run the risk of being wrong. It is impossible to honestly make the claim, especially if it's a general claim like EMDR, EMDR works for uh, PTSD, um, that you have proof for a general claim like that. You only have evidence, and Popper would say corroborating evidence. As long as it's not falsified, you have confirming evidence, and that's corroborating evidence. So this means that you have to be careful and must never say that something has, to, has been proven or you have to claim or make a claim that the therapy works for everyone. And these things happen. Here's a quote from someone uh, about EMDR. She says, first of all, many times therapists present the effect of EMDR too optimistic. I treated a boy of 11 who was afraid of fainting at school. In class during recess at PE, it got worse and worse. When I saw him, he was disappointed with another psychologist. He had already had five EMDR sessions. He did not understand it. His therapist had told him that EMDR works for everyone. Well, except for him. There must be something seriously wrong with me, the boy had concluded. That's not helping the boy, right? So be careful in the claims you make. They should be falsifiable, but never too strong. Let's look at an important implication of Popper's falsificationism. If he's right and you have a claim, take the example all swans are white, then you can only find corroborating evidence for that. That means that you find support for your thesis, for your claim, because you fail to falsify your theory. You were looking for a black swan or at least for a non-white swan and you didn't find any. And then you have corroborating evidence. But if you would take that as proof, then you use induction. Then you say, okay, I, ha I have uh, seen several, but not all swans. All the swans I saw were white and therefore they are all white. That's induction. That is an invalid way of reasoning. And in some sense, you could argue that if you then still use induction in science, that would be irrational. And Popper, being a rationalist, will claim that science is rational. I will get to uh, the specifications of what he means by that in a moment. 
So what you can do as a scientist is you can only accept of a theory, take a theory to be true as long as it is not falsified. And then you always basically have to say, I do not know whether the theory is true, but the moment it's falsified, you know that it's false. And that's why we can only increase knowledge, according to Popper, through actual falsification. So if you have seen a black swan, then you know, ah, not all swans are white, or all swans are white is false. And then you adjust your theory, in this case about swans, and that is what Popper calls the negative way to the truth. You don't have a positive way to do the truth, a direct way to the truth that uh, provides you with proof for any, uh, any claim. So it's a negative way to the, to the truth. And obviously, you, have, you can make all kinds of theories, and then you falsify a lot of them. And then, you, in the end, of course, you hope to uh, only have one theory left. But still, you can only take the theory for, to, to be true as long as it is not falsified. What Popper does says is that we can learn from our mistakes. And we don't have a direct way to the truth. You can never prove a claim. You can only falsify a claim, so we only have a roundabout way to the truth. And that means that every scientific claim always has a hypothetical character. Even though it has a lot of corroborating evidence, you still do not know whether it's true. Hence, he says, every scientific claim is a hypothesis. Let me point out a clear difference between the logical positivists and Popper. In an earlier lecture, we saw that the young Wittgenstein was interested in separating meaningful from meaningless claims, and the logical positivist then used his theory to do the same, and at the same time, because they think that the categories coincide, a meaningful claim is a scientific claim, and a meaningless claim is an unscientific claim, they say, well, you can use that to distinguish between science and pseudoscience and meaningful and meaningless claims. And Popper says, I'm only interested in the distinction between science and pseudoscience. And he even argues that pseudoscientific claims can be meaningful. We do know what we mean by them. So he's not interested in the meaning versus meaningless debate. He says, some unscientific claims can be meaningful. And I don't think that that's a strange claim, because if you take a look at ancient mythology, well, that's not science, but it is meaningful. You, you know what, uh, uh, what's being meant when you read ancient uh, uh, myths. And he says, some, sometimes science also can start as a myth. For instance, the theory of evolution, we now have a theory of evolution by natural selection. Uh, but in ancient times, uh, in, in the words of Empedocles, uh, we also find some kind of evolution, uh, an idea of evolution, uh, but it's in a myth. It is, it is uh, about how human beings came to be the beings we are, with two arms, two legs, uh, a body and a, um, and a head. And the idea is, OK, uh, they tried two arms and one leg. Well, that didn't work. Uh, two legs and a body. Well, that didn't work. And then what did work? Well, two arms, two legs, a body and a head. So there is a kind of evolution by natural, by, by kind of selection, not by natural selection, but some kind of selection in ancient mythology. Um, and then you can use that uh, to generate uh, scientific hypothesis. Maybe there actually is a kind of natural selection, for instance. He doesn't say that Darwin came to this idea based on a reading a Peter Glass, but uh, that idea uh, can be found in mythology. Uh, also, if you look at Freudian psychoanalysis, um, clearly 
Popper is uh, arguing against that as uh, he, he claims that that's a pseudoscience, but that doesn't mean that there are no meaningful claims in them. You can use them, the theory, you can use psychoanalysis, for instance, with respect to uh, the unconsciousness. Okay, does that exist? What is it? Are, is there unconscious information processing? Well, turn the pseudoscience, turn some claims out of pseudoscience into falsifiable hypotheses and test them. Try to falsify them. And then you might find corroborating evidence and then for the time being you can accept them as being true. So he's not interested in meaning versus meaningless claims and he certainly doesn't agree with the logical positivist that um, uh, scientific claims are the same, is the same, or it belong to the same set, uh, or is the same set as meaningful claims. Popper calls himself a critical rationalist. We've seen earlier that rationalists like Plato and Descartes accept inborn ideas. Plato obviously is very radical. All ideas are inborn. All knowledge is inborn. You can't really learn something new, but only remember your old ideas. And Descartes is already. Uh, much uh, less radical. Uh, he believes in that some concepts are innate, but others are acquired, and then you test them to your ratio. Popper is even less convinced of this theory of in, uh, innate ideas. So what, how does he think about that? Because he believes in some kind of innate knowledge, if you will, uh, but uh, in a very subtle way. He says the theory of inborn ideas is absurd, I think. But every organism has inborn reactions or responses, and among them, responses adapted to impeding events. These responses we may describe as expectations, without implying that these, ex that these expectations are conscious. So. This is not really odd, I think. You're not born with the idea of God or of a triangle, and it clearly also applies to other animals. So, for instance, many animals can walk immediately after birth, and that's really convenient because otherwise there would be some predator's dinner. Um, So if an animal can do that, the animal doesn't need to learn that it can walk on the ground or that it cannot go through a tree. It's not that by uh, trial and error, an animal needs to learn that. Something you cannot look through is something you cannot walk through. So if a predator is chasing you, don't try to run through the tree. And indeed, that's not something the animal will have conscious knowledge of. It doesn't have language to think about that in, in some uh, in, in a way. So it is, you, you see, it's a skill. It is indeed an expectation it has. It's unconscious. It even it, it doesn't even try to walk to, through a tree, right? Or it doesn't even try to walk in the air uh, and then tries to come up with other hypotheses. Maybe walking on the ground is a good idea. No, that's immediately what happens. Also, newborns expect to be fed and protected. So there are basically all kinds of instincts that Popper is talking about. And I don't think that that's strange to accept as a um, modern day uh, rationalist. And what Popper says in this quote is one of the most important of these expectations is the expectation of finding a regularity. Yes, that is what we do. We see regularity even if it's not there, to paraphrase um, Bacon. Right? We've seen it in an earlier lecture. And that takes us, this problem of induction, this idea of induction, to critical rationalism. Okay, so we are born with the expectation that the world uh, contains all kinds of regularities. And Popper says that expectation leads to dogmatic thinking. 
basically what he says is we are induction machines echoing Hume, echoing Bacon, echoing um, Aristotle. And if you look at Bacon, Bacon said, what's wrong with Aristotle's ideas of induction? Well, he didn't take the problem of induction seriously enough. So what Bacon said is, if you find a irregularity in one place, try to falsify it by looking at another place. So in Athens, all human beings are mortal. Yeah. Is that also the case in London? So Bacon tried to falsify his general claims that he, he had gotten to by induction. And Aristotle did not do that or not do that uh, enough, according to Bacon. And that, that latter point is basically what Popper is making here. He says, this expectation leads to dogmatic thinking, to not think critically about your own general concepts. So basically what Popper says is we are dogmatic thinkers by nature. We have seen, it, 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 it doesn't even take a constant conjunction uh, as we saw in, in, in Hume, it just takes a conjunction. You have A immediately followed by B, uh, in, in place and time uh, near to each other, and then you will think that A caused B. If you've gotten sick from eating some type of food, well, then you also conclude that. But you also conclude that if you contracted a virus somewhere and you, you mistakenly attribute your sickness to the food you ate, so we are dogmatic thinkers by nature. Popper then says, in this case, the same as Bacon already said, that we sometimes merely see regularity or think to see regularity where uh, there is no regularity at all. So we need to be careful not to think that our claims are true. Do not accept statements without critical reflection. So being critical is trying to see that your theory or your statement can be falsified. That's what you need to do. That's why he is a critical rationalist. To be critical means to ask the question, am I right? Knowingly that human beings are fallible and that we are induction machines and that in all likelihood we make all kind of false inferences, especially when we're thinking about general laws. Just like Bacon, Popper de facto warns us for confirmation bias. So we have this tendency to find evidence in favor of our beliefs and to disregard evidence that refutes our beliefs. And what do you need to do as a scientist? Well, you should not be looking for evidence in favor of your hypothesis, but you should try to falsify the hypothesis. You should look for falsification. And then if you don't find the falsification, but you find corroborating evidence, then you can say, I think my hypothesis is true. You can never say, I know my hypothesis is true. And that's also why you need to be very careful with a client as a psychologist, as a clinical psychologist. Suppose that some GP um, sends, if you're a clinical psychologist, sends a, a client to you and the GP says, I think that this person has disorder X, whatever it may be. Then you should not only test for disorder X, <laughs> you should try to falsify that claim because otherwise <laughs> you might start a therapy with a person for the wrong disorder. <laughs> so try to falsify it. So look at syndromes, disorders that have uh, similar behavioral features, for instance, and test for them as well and see whether you can make a distinction and see whether you can. And, and basically you're trying to falsify them all. But in, then, then it turns out you have 
the most corroborating evidence, maybe for this other lie and not for X, and then you have refuted that hypothesis that this person suffers from this other X, and then you have good reasons to believe you can that hold that for true because you didn't falsify that that this person has this auto i maybe you should do some more testing for things that look like this auto i <laughs> that didn't always look like this auto x so you should do some severe testing and then accept the hypothesis that has the most corroborating evidence um, so you should try to falsify your hypothesis or the hypothesis of the GP, for instance. Popper tries to get rid of induction and he tries to replace scientific thinking, making inference in science, by using deduction. So what do you do when you have a hypothesis that you try to falsify, but you fail to do so? Then you can accept the theory. That is, you know it might be false, but for the moment you only have corroborating evidence and no evidence to the contrary. Is that irrational? And Popper says, no, that's not irrational because you're not using induction here, but deduction. Being critical means that if you have a claim, a general claim, like all swans are white, or EMDR, uh, EMDR works for uh, PTSD, then what you need to do as a researcher, as a scientist, is you have to look for the swan that's not white. You look for a black swan or a blue swan, or you look for someone that has uh, PTSD for which uh, EMDR doesn't work. And then you say, okay, basically you use deduction and that's a logically valid way of reasoning. And, and we'll, we'll get back to that in the alternative tutorials as well. Basically what you say, if I have a general claim, all A's are B, then I will predict, of course, that the next A will be B. So all swans are white, then I go look out in the world for the next swan, I find the swan, and my prediction will be that it's white. Now, if I say all swans are white, I find the swan, and the swan is black, then I can reason back and say, well, either this is not a swan or all swans are white is false. And then you have used deduction to show that either your um, general claim uh, is wrong or that your assessment of this animal here being a swan is wrong. And then you still, then you're using deduction and that is a valid way of reasoning. You're using this deductive scheme all A's are B, this is an A and therefore it's B. If your uh, two premises are true, if all A's are B, and if this is an A, then the truth of this is a B is entailed by the truth of these two premises. The truth of your conclusion is logically valid. And this means that any theory in science basically remains a set of hypotheses. Even if you have a large amount of data that shows you that so far EMDR has worked for clients with PTSD, there might be a case where it doesn't work. And it might also be the case that the effect is caused by something else than this specific theory. So this specific therapy, it could be that just any therapy works. And then this therapy also will work. And then you find late, you find out later maybe that it's not due to uh, the explanation you gave for the reason why uh, EMDR worked. Um, so any theory remains a hypothesis. Okay, so we're using deduction in science according to Popper and not induction. So in some way you get to a hypothesis and that's not by observation and then using in induction. So Popper has a different model of science than the logical positivists had because they had that model, which is a sensible model by the way, but Popper really doesn't want induction. So he says, 
Newton sees the apple falling from the tree and comes up with a hypothesis and then goes to test this, which means that he tries to falsify it. And then you're using deduction. So that is contrary to the use of induction, a phallic way of reasoning. And therefore, it is a rational way of reasoning. And that makes science that only uses deduction, according to Popper, or well, that only that, that uses deduction in, and not induction, um, a rational uh, enterprise. So that's where um, a large part of uh, his idea, his classification of his philosophy of science as critical rationalism resides. So you use deduction and not induction. But is that true? Can you do science without induction? It looks like Popper did better than the empiricist, but Popper's view is not without problems. A very serious problem with Popper's demarcation criterion, falsifiability, is that many pseudosciences or many disciplines we want to classify as pseudoscience like astrology also make falsifiable claims there's an, um, a famous example there was a bunch of skeptics from uh, kansas and what they did is they took the data uh, that astrologers claim to need to make uh, a description of a person a personality of someone uh, they took them to different astrologers and they, so they, you need a bird place the bird uh, date and time uh, and you take that to um, to the astrologers and then they tell you this person is blah 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 then they, they give you a personality description well, what did they did they claim it's sad this person is a good role model and this person is very good with children now i do know about you but it turned out that this was not a good role model and it could be debated where he was very good with children because they used the data of john wayne gacy who was a serial killer who killed uh, boys and a young man he performed as pogo the clown so we could say well he is good with children um and well he, he got uh, arrested and he got a death penalty in 1994 um but it's not about that it's about that these claims by the astrologers were falsified and if they were falsified so uh he's good at it I, I think it's very clear that he is not a good role model you don't want to do uh, to people to act like like him um, so the claims by the astrologers were falsified or at least falsifiable uh, and that's the important thing and thus they were scientific and this means that even though astrology makes all kinds of claims like tomorrow you will uh, you, you might run into trouble at work yeah that's always possible and that is an unfalsifiable claim but sometimes they make these claims like this this person is a really good role model well he isn't that's a falsifiable claim and therefore that part of astrology is science is scientific those claims are scientific so that is a big problem pseudoscience makes falsifiable claims at least sometimes that's one problem and there's another problem and that has to do with Popper's rejection of induction he doesn't want induction in science so he says I want deduction all A's are B this is an A therefore B if it turns out not B then he wants to say that um, all A's are B is falsified how do you do that well all swans are white then you predict that the next swan will be white and then it turns out you find a black swan and then you say okay i'm using deduction at uh, the deduction uh, deductive scheme to uh, to argue that um, all swans are white is false 
But how do you determine that this is a black swan? That's based on induction. Because you say, all animals that are birds, that have these long necks, that swim in water, uh, that has these particular beaks, uh, those are swans, and this one is black. But how do you know that? How did you get to this general concept of what a swan is? And that takes us all the way back to Aristotle. Well, via induction. So it's not only about sentences, all swans are white, it's also about general concepts. And that was the thing that Aristotle wanted to explain. But that general concept, that rule, if you want, that can be expressed, uh, that, that the concept can be expressed in this rule, um, we have arrived at that by using induction because you have seen an animal like that and then another animal like that and another animal like that and constantly your parents or your teachers said that's a swan, that's a swan, that's a swan and you used induction to come up with this general concept of what a swan is and then you apply that to this animal and then say oh but this is a swan and a swan is black and that's the use of induction in recognizing that this is a swan. So determining that the general statement is false is based on the induction because for the individual A, the individual swan, that refutes the general claim, namely the black swan, the A that's not B, you need to use induction. So that's a serious problem. So that's a second serious problem with Popper's critical rationalism. Basically, what we have to conclude is that neither empiricism nor rationalism has provided us with a good answer, a satisfying answer to the question, what distinguishes science from pseudoscience? So the conclusion is that falsifiability doesn't work as a demarcation criterion. It does do one thing, right? It makes us a distinction between scientific claims and pseudoscientific claims, where confirmability and verifiability either put everything in one category or in the other. Here we actually have two categories, science and non-science, and they both contain sentences. But the set of scientific sentences is too large. There are all kinds of claims that are falsifiable, hence are classified as being scientific, that actually are not scientific. On the other hand, you can say that every claim that is not falsifiable indeed is unscientific, so it works a little bit, but not enough. And Popper uses, um, he, he tries to get rid of induction, and that doesn't work here. Tom Derrickson, um, philosopher of science from the Netherlands, says, well, falsification alone leads to nothing. And that's basically what's going on. You cannot have an anti-inductivist falsificationism because you will have um, induction in your scientific methods, in your scientific reasoning, and also false falsifiability on its own is not a strong enough demarcation criterion. And that means that both the contemporary version of empiricism and the contemporary version of rationalism have some problems because both projects failed. At least they failed to show what the demarcation criterion between science and pseudoscience is. Which leads to a conclusion. Maybe we cannot find such a demarcation criterion. Should we not give up on that project? This is a historical overview. So now empiricism and rationalism had failed to provide an answer to the question what distinguishes science from pseudoscience. We have to take a look at how philosophers responded to this failure. Next time we'll take a look at um, the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, and he argues that it is more interesting to describe 
how science changes than to try to find a demarcation criterion. So he's not, he says, let, let's, let's not do that, let's not try to find a demarcation criterion, but let's try to describe uh, how science changes through time. Right, so this leaves me with um, discussing an uh, example question. So the question obviously is about Karl Popper. Which of the following statements would you attribute to Popper? A, the confirmation of hypothesis results in knowledge. Well, it's not the confirmation of hypothesis that results in knowledge, right? That would be something uh, that the logical positivists uh, claimed. Um, so we only learn something when we have falsified a claim. So the refutation of hypothesis results in knowledge. Yes, if you refute, if you falsify the claim, all swans are white, then you know that not all swans are white. So B is correct. C, both the confirmation uh, of and the refutation of hypothesis results in knowledge. Well, that's obviously for the same reason, as wrong for the same reason as A is wrong. And D, growth of knowledge is impossible. That is also incorrect. Popper would argue that the refutation of hypothesis results in knowledge, so growth of knowledge is possible, so D therefore also is incorrect. That's it for lecture 5. Stay safe.